I want to tell you a bit about myself. I'm based in Berlin, although I'm originally from Spain, so you can see from my beautiful accent. Um, I build mobile tools for Shopify. How many of you know Shopify? Cool. It's like an e-commerce platform. If you want to sell your products online, you can go there, create a store, super easy, and then you sell your products. Uh, I love doing open source work. Uh, Twist is one of the tools that I'm working on, and I will do a demo at the end. You can find me on Twitter, or on GitHub with the same with the same username. So, this is what I would like to talk to you uh, or present today. First, I would like to uh, kind of tell you why you should invest in tooling. Second, I would like to give you some tips on, uh, like, based in our experience on how tooling should be designed. And finally, I would like to give you some examples of how we are creating tools at Shopify and maybe give you a motivation to do the same at your companies. So I'm sure most of you agree with me that uh, we need tools to create apps. Like otherwise, it's impossible. And if that sounds very abstract, I'm going to show you some icons. Uh, we need this code because we need a way to tell the system what uh, we want the app to do. Um, we need Fastlane. We need some automation in our apps. If you are a huge company and you want your build times to be fast, probably something like Bazel to speed up build times. Or if you want to uh, tell the system how to how to render the views, you have now like a declarative way of, of doing that. In that case, the tooling is not our tool, it's something that Apple is giving us. So tools make us productive, um, bring us focus, because the things that a computer can do for us, we don't have to do it. So if you spend less time figuring out issues, doing manual work, the tools do that for you. They can prevent errors. Errors will happen because we are humans, we make mistakes, and we are the ones doing the software. So they will happen. So our tools can prevent those errors and can handle them so that we don't have to deal with all that stuff ourselves. They can automate all the manual work. If you are doing something very manual, tool can help you with that. You don't have to do that. So that's why we have tools like Fastlane and a bunch of other automation tools. And uh, tools are a shared language. Like when you are working in a company and you go to any other team that is using the same paradigms, is using the same tools, is using the same IDE, you can talk to them. You speak the same language. And I think it's beautiful when the company is huge and you can go to any other team and you can speak the same language. That's something that tools enable. What happens with tools is that they are usually designed for a group of users, and those users have needs. Um, if we look at S-Code, uh, S-Code is mostly optimized uh, for small and medium-sized apps. When apps grow, there's a lot of complexity. There are many projects, many targets, high compilation times as well and no flexibility to change the build process. I don't know if you try to do stuff with the build phases, but they are not very flexible, and you can see that. Uh, Fastlane, it's uh, mostly optimized for teams that barely have time to invest into tooling, so you can easily add Fastlane, add a bunch of lanes, and everything works. But as soon as you start like using Fastlane a lot in big companies, you will realize that you will end up with super complex fast files, nothing is tested, like it's really hard to read those files. We can go to Bazel, and uh, I don't know, how many of you know about Bazel? Perfect, it's like a build system that has incremental compilations across uh, um, everyone in the team using a cache, uh, and big companies are using it. What happens if you, use, you try to use that in your small app? It introduces a necessary overhead. You don't need that tool. You might need it in the future, but you don't need it now. So I don't think there are good or bad tools. I think there are tools that are better or worse for your needs, and you need to think about that. When you use a tool, you have to ask yourself, is this really for me? What I've seen in most companies and teams is that when developers find that a tool doesn't fit their need exactly, they tweak it. They do it. Oh, I, I need to do this, and I add this piece of code here, and everything works. Let's look at this one. So we are working with S code, which is a tool, and it's super slow. So I've seen person X who works for company Y, who published this tweet talking about the flag set, which should speed up compilation. Well, I have the same flag. It works. Oh, I don't have a fast lane lane to do this. What should I do? And then I go to Stack Overflow. I search for the same thing. I found this beautiful Ruby method. I put it in my fast file. Everything works. Those are tweaks. We are tweaking the tool so that they work for what we need. And we don't want to uh, tweak tools. We want uh, well-designed tools because those are manageable. You can go, you can see the code, you can understand it. They are consistent. You can go to several places of the tool and you understand everything because it's consistent. 
Um, you can share code. You don't need to, you don't have a lot of duplication. That's something that I've seen, for example, in fast files a lot. Uh, you can build tools that are reliable, that you can test them, and you make sure the developers, the tools will do what developers expect from them. They are deterministic. You can execute the same tool several times. You will get the same results. You want the errors to be readable. You don't want to see like an error that you don't know what to do with it. And finally, you can have like reproducible environments. You want to, the same thing that happens on CI, that happens locally. So high quality tools, I don't know if you agree with me on this one, but high quality tools means developers are productive and therefore they are motivated. And if they are motivated, they will have, they will create great products. And if your company doesn't trust you in this one, you should really tell them this is true. Like I've seen that in companies and if they have the right tools to do the work, they do it faster and they do it better. So high, like high quality tools, it's nice, but I, I guess you wonder, um, how can we build those high quality tools? I'm gonna give you 10 tips uh, that work for us. Um, maybe it doesn't work exactly the same way for you, but I think it applies, so yes, bear with me. Um, first of all, you need to talk to users. Users are developers. If something doesn't work, they will work around it. They won't tell you, build this thing for me, because I need it. They will tell you, oh, this is horrible, I don't wanna use this, this is very slow, but they won't ever tell you, build this thing for me. So talk to users. What we did at Shopify is we did user interviews. We, we talked to developers, we asked them, tell us, tell us how is your process, tell us the problems, tell us the manual work that you have to do. Don't focus on solutions, focus on the problems that they have. So we interview a bunch of teams at Shopify. We kind of extracted some patterns that you can see there on the slide. So they were mentioning things like, oh, build times are slow, we would like to have support for code coverage, we would like to automate the generation of certificates for push notifications. So talk to your users. Don't make up ideas for tooling. You need to talk to them. They have needs, so if you cannot work with them, talk to them. So you need to, if you provide a tool, the tool most likely depends on the environment, and the environment changes. And it's really hard. I don't know a company that kind of controls everything in every developer's machine. So things can change. New version of Escort, a new version of uh, Fastlane. So make sure that your tools have integration tests, that they run real, like I'm gonna show you an example so that you understand it better. So we have this tool that abstracts uh, or wraps the Scott build command. So we wanna make sure that if we have a project, we are able to compile it, test it. In this case, we have a uh, logic for retrying the flaky test automatically. So we wanna make verify that that logic is working. You can see also like an example with uh, Gradle. We have an actual Android project. We make sure that it compiles and everything. It does what it should do. If you give the users a tool, you need to understand how they are using the tool. It's not like, oh, use it, that's it. No, you want to understand what, what, what they need, how they are using it, otherwise you can improve your tools. Um, so this is an example of um, uh, like tooling that we have at Shopify over CI infrastructure, it's something that we maintain, and we report most of the metrics to Datadog. And here you can see like how many builds are being run, how many, uh, the time that it takes, um, you can also see on the right side how many hosts we have, if they have memory, if they have disk space. If something um, is not how it should be, like the, the hosts are running out of a space, we get alerts. So we know there are things that we need to change, things to improve, things to fix. So always add um, metrics to your, to your tools. Also because you want to, when you prioritize the work, you want to work on something that people find valuable. You don't want to work on something that people don't use. So if you get metrics, you know how many people are using those tools. Tools are software. What do I mean by that? Yeah, like you build apps, and I'm sure you add tests, unit tests, integration tests, UI tests, like all kinds of tests. This is software as well. Tools are software, and they need the same love that you put into your apps. So I've seen like many uh, tools written like if they were bash scripts. They are not, they are software, so that means tests. That means readable code, well-structured code. So don't forget about that. Things change in your project, in your company, in your team. The tools that you build today might not necessarily work in like three months. So always keep an eye on, try to evolve the tools as things change around. That means, at the beginning it's probably like some tweaking, but don't tweak forever. Like uh, there will be a point where you need to really question if that tool that you are using is the one that you should continue using. Then, that's something that we prefer at Shopify. I've seen like other companies following a different approach here, but we prefer always convention over configuration. 
what does configuration mean? Well, configuration means you, you give developers an API and you give them the flexibility to decide how to do things. On the right side, you see an example of how developers used to release apps at Shopify. It was like a fast file. Like, um, I don't know if you can see the code, but they read some environment variables. They make some changes in the scope project. Then they do some bunch of other stuff. Then they end up compiling. This is too complex. Uh, you want the things to be simple. So we ended up, uh, I'm gonna show you that later, but uh, we have a YAML file where projects tell us what they need, how they would like us to release the app, and we do everything. They don't have to imperatively tell or call commands or stuff like that. So if you want to release an app at Shopify, put a YAML file, we will do everything for you. So we make thi things simple. I know it sounds kind of like limiting, but I think limiting, it's sometimes good. Because if you don't limit, you will end up with a lot of complexity. So the standard output and error is a limited uh, resource, so don't waste it. So if you look at the terminal in the first window, you see that we are trying to build something. First message that we get is, oh, there's an update. There are some plugins enabled. We are running all these compiler commands, and then everything succeeded. Do we need the information about the update? No, when I want to update it, I do it. Do we need information about the plugins? Well, if we have 100 plugins, do you want to see 100 entries there? It doesn't bring you any value. Maybe compilation information, because we want to know that there is something going on, but the compiler commands with the arguments that are being passed, you don't want that. So uh, on the window below, you see like another example of, oh, I'm compiling this iOS app, so I want to know that there is something going on. Tell me which modules you are compiling. When everything finishes, tell me, that's fine. And if it errors, tell me what happens. Errors. Um, when things fail, developers need to know what to do next. If we give developers a stack trace, uh, I don't think they can do much with it. So how many of you would know what to do with, the, with this? Can you, what would be your next thing to do if you see that on your terminal? Well, you see a stack trace of a tool that someone gave to you. You see that something failed. It's like going to a website and get, seeing like a server error or something like that. You can't do anything with that. So what we could do is, well, we know that the scope build failed, so that means the compilation might have failed. So we tell developer, these are the logs. Look at them. You can use them for debugging. And if you believe everything is fine or you, on, on your side, then as the last resource, you can come to us and we'll help you with debugging. But at least give developers an action item. Otherwise, they don't know what to do. We give them the stack trace, which is only information that we need for debugging, not for them. Tools are products. Um, what does it mean? Well, it's not just I develop the tool. First, you need to have the idea for the tool. Then you need to design the tool. You implement it, which is the development part. But then you need documentation, because if developers want to use it, you don't want them to be asking you, hey, can you help me to use this tool? You need to release it, uh, give support for it. Like People will have problems using the tool, so you need to talk to them and see what you can improve there. And finally, like they will probably give you feedback of things that you could improve, so iterate on that. And the last tip that I would like to give you, and I'm gonna connect that with the next section of the presentation, is questions are opportunities to build tools. That means that whenever someone is asking you something or complaining about something, don't say I'm gonna fix this for you quickly and forget about it, no. That means you probably have something to improve there. So I'm gonna give you some examples of those kind of questions or concerns that developers had at Shopify and how we solve them. So let's say you have a developer saying, I'm trying to set up my local environment to work with this project, but I can't figure out how. So what most projects do is we have a readme file with a setup section saying clone repository, run bundle install, run bundle exec something, and then it should work. Sometimes it doesn't. So this is what we build at Shopify. So any developer, I don't know if you see that, yeah. So any developer at Shopify, they can clone the uh, repository. They have this dev tool that every developer at Shopify has. So you do dev app, and it knows what it needs to be installed. That includes S-Code, Homebrew, Carthage, CocoaPods, this and that, all the tools. And it does it for you. And if it fails, it does some smart logic to kind of find a way to install the tool. Um, that is very useful. I can go to any Android repository, and I don't have Android Studio, Android SDK. I can do dev clone, dev app, dev build, and everything builds. So this is very useful. 
this is another one that we got, which is, uh, like at Shopify, it's very common to go to any PR, any branch, and try it on your device. But if the project is large, uh, it will take a lot of time to, co to compile. Hopefully, this will change with Swift UI, but until then, we had to build something for developers. So this is what we built. We call it Top Hat. Um, you can Top Hat anyone's uh, PR or build easily. So you go to your terminal, you can see that everything is built in the same uh, tool for developers. You can do dev iOS Top Hat. You can pass the PR. You can also indicate the, the build guide build, or Travis, or whatever CI platform you use or the branch, and this is what we do. I think this is magic whenever I see it. So you run the command. We know there is one app. We pull it for you. We ask you, OK, in which simulator would you like to open it? And we open the simulator with the app. And we print the logs in the console. So if something crashes, you see the crashes directly on your terminal. So no more having to find where the crashes are because you have them there. So you can see what's going on. You can use that for every app at Shopify, including Android apps as well. Then we have this other one, which I talked about before, which is oh, releasing apps is so frustrating. Uh, the last time that I that I tried, it failed because of signing issues, and uh, it's kind of annoying, no? So we were like, okay, we want to build something here because we, I think I didn't say, but we have several iOS and Android apps, and we would like to, we wanted to also standardize the way we release apps to the store. So that was our answer. Uh, in this case, it's not a command line tool; it's an internal website. So you can see here all the projects that can be released at Shopify, and then you can see the last release, and if they are currently releasing apps. In this view, you can see uh, like the kind of the main page of each project, where you can see the active release, and you can also see the releases from the past. And you can see if they were completed or they were canceled. So when you start a new release, you have the option to um, start the release from a hotfix. In that case, we offer you, we tell you to start a release from the commit associated to the last release, or you can start a new release. We offer you the build number, uh, the version number, automatically by bumping the minor version by one. And you can see a list of commits. We synchronize them. So you can always see the status of the commit. You see that you cannot release the latest one because it's yellow. That means we are compiling and running things on CI. Um, but you can do the release with the previous one. At Shopify, we trust people. That means we try. Uh, we do our best for people not to make mistakes, but we trust you. That means if you want to really release that app because you know everything is fine, there is an emergency button. You click it, and you can release from any commit. So that's something kind of cool, like trusting people. If you don't have that value, I think it's crucial for like building tools and things. Um, so you have a release. You can see who is the captain. Even though we automate things, I think it's important to have one person that makes decision and clicks um, buttons. Um, and you can see every time we build a commit, we call the thing a candidate because it can potentially be released. We build everything. So the developer doesn't need to know anything about who are you guys compiling this. Well, you don't care. We do it. If something breaks, we fix it. If the signing is failing, we fix it. So developers are super happy because they don't have to deal with these things themselves. Um, when everything finishes, we export artifacts. You can see in that case it's um, APKs for Android. And then you have different channels. So you can roll out the app to uh, appetize. You can roll out the app to Google Play Store in case of iOS is test flight, um, App Center from Microsoft. So you just click here, click here, upload, done. And I would like to finish with uh, talking about this last problem that I, I actually um, had it in my previous company. Like the project was growing and uh, things were getting super complex with Scope projects, so I decided to automate that somehow. So I, I built a tool that I would like to demo if everything is fine. I'm really bad with demos, but we'll see. So this is the name of the tool. Um, and I could explain it to you how it works, but I think it's better if you see it live. So let's go to the terminal. So let's say, I don't know if you see, uh, you don't see anything. That's perfect. Mm -hmm. Cool. Can you see the eye? Perfect. So we want to create a new um, iOS app. So we create a directory. We can call it um, my app, or let's call it alconf. Yes. Perfect. Up. So we go to that directory, and then we say, OK, first of all, I want to make sure that uh, 
we are using the right version and for that we have a command that makes sure that everyone, I said before that it's important that things are reproducible so all developers should use the same tool. I don't want another person to run the same command and get different results. So I say in this directory I want you to use this version of the tool. So I do twist local, use this version. And it creates a file that is like pinning uh, my local folder to that version. So now I do twist in it. Um, by default, the platform is iOS and it creates an app, but you can say I want a framework, I want macOS, iOS, so you can customize that. So we create the project. Uh, I'm gonna open it with Xcode, the previous version of the beta. So we don't have anything. We have something called manifest and I will tell you what that is, but let's generate the project. So we'll first generate, uh, generate, uh, that was unexpected. Uh, Perfect. So I got the project, which is this one, I can open it. And then we see that we get the project generated automatically with one, you might wonder where is the project defined? Like how can you specify what's the structure of the project? Well, there is a file called project.swift. If you use the Swift package manager, that probably sounds familiar. So it's like the same idea, but not for defining packages, more like for defining um, your projects. So one thing that I'm gonna do, this has like a target with the, um, with the main applications on test. I would like to add a new target and I'm gonna call it like, it's gonna be a framework. So I call this one framework, core name, platform iOS, product is framework. The autocompletion should work, but with the new beta version, I think everything was uh, messed up. So I'm gonna, I know the syntax, I think so. So I change the bundle ID. I'm gonna say that this uh, file is in uh, core info playlist. Um, then this should be sources, Swift. If the completion works, you should get all the documentation and everything for free so you don't have to, it helps a lot to define this. And this one doesn't have any dependencies, but I would like my app to depend on that framework. Well, I have this dependency section here where I can say, perfect, I want you to depend on the target that is called core. Something like that. Perfect. So we can go back and we can say, okay, twist, generate. First thing that it tells me is, oh, this info list, I can't find it. Makes sense, no, it should be there. So if something is not where it should be, we fail immediately. We don't want people to start compilation if things won't compile or what will compile but with a uh, bad uh, result. So I'm gonna copy the, the info list, the main one, into the core folder and then I put it there. So then I'm gonna create like a Swift file with nothing, just a class. So let me open it here. I go, can you see, no. I'm gonna call this one core, Swift, import foundation, and then I do public final class core, public init, and that's it. I don't want anything else. So I go back, and then I generate the project again, and then I open the project. So if I go here, you can see that there is a new framework, you can see that um, Alconf, the app, is first linking that framework. If it needs to be embedded because the framework is dynamic, we embed it for you. If it's static, we do it for you. We do everything that you need for linking. We don't have to do that anymore because why should you do that? We should tell Apple about that. Um, so let's say I wanna add Arac Swift, a library that we took from the repository. It's a dynamic framework and we have the binary here. So I take this and I'm gonna put it here. I downloaded it from, from their uh, website and it's a framework that has been compiled with Carthage. So it has the architectures for simulator and device. So I'm gonna go back to my project, this one here, and then I can say, okay, core now depends on that framework. Again, like you should get the syntax uh, auto-completion, but uh, for some reason, uh, the latest school version messed it up. So framework path 
rx swift dot framework. Cool. So uh, you you see that I'm closing S code every time. That's something like uh, S code doesn't reload the changes properly. I need to have a look at that. But when I generate the project and then I open our conf. So I don't know if you know, but when you have a framework that has architectures for. So when you have a framework that has architectures for a simulator and device, you need to strip them when you copy the framework because you don't want the architectures that are not necessary. That's something that Carthage does when you add a new build phase that calls Carthage. But uh, I think I opened the project, yeah. We do that for you. So if we go to the app, you see um, we are embedding core. That makes sense. We are linking core. And there is a new section here called embed pre-compiled frameworks that calls twist embed Rx Swift. So we are doing the stripping, we are doing the copy, we do it for you. You don't have to think about defining those phases yourself. So you can imagine this expanding to all the frameworks that you have, all the static libraries, and we'll do all the settings and build phases for you. If you want to customize things like build settings, configurations, that's something that you can do yourself, uh, which is not possible with the package manager, but. Um, I'm going to show you something new that I built this morning. Uh, it's kind of like a one more thing. Um, let me see if it works. So I'm going to switch to the latest Twist version, which is, I think it's like that, and it should work. Perfect. So let's say we want to add a package, it's a dependency. And I'm going to add the same, one, the same one that Apple added yesterday, which is the Yams for parsing YAML. So if I open my project, and in this case, uh, I'm going to do it with the latest S code version. Boom, auto completion, nice. So I want to add a new dependency to my app, which is that library. So I do target dependency, and I have this guy here, which is super cool. What would it do? So I'm going to copy this here. The product name is Yams, which is the name of the library that they are exporting from their package. And I can say that I want um, the version to be exact. I want the version to be this one. I can get rid of this because the compiler will infer that for me. That's it. Let's see if it works. And if it works, that will be a successful demo. Up. Up. You see, we have the YAMS dependency uh, being pulled. Um, and you can go to your app, and we have the library here being linked automatically. The S code did the resolution of that dependency. And if I compile the app, it should compile. I don't know if you saw yesterday, but uh, the dependencies from the Swift Package Manager are static, so we don't need to embed and do anything like that. It will um, link everything in the app bundle. Cool, so that was the, that was the demo. Let me give you some conclusions and then so as I said at the beginning, investing in tooling is something that you might not see a lot of value uh, on tooling, but uh, in the long term, I think it makes total sense, especially if you have an ambitious uh, future for your project or company, you should really invest in tooling. Tools are products. They need to be developed, but they also need to be designed, um, like uh, documented. Um, you need to give feedback. No, they need to give feedback to you. You need to give support. So they deserve the same love that you put into your product. So think about tools as your software. In the same way you build apps, you build um, tools. And the cool thing is that you can do that now in Swift. You have the Swift Package Manager, so you don't need to do it in Ruby. You can do it in Swift in a language that you know. You use Foundation, you use all the APIs that you're familiar with. And finally, like don't push the tweaks beyond their limits, because at some point there is a need for a tool. Build it in the same way you build your apps. Um, so that was it. The slides are, are published there. 
I want to say also that we are hiring, so if uh, Shopify sounds appealing to you and you would like to work in these kind of things, uh, please come and talk to me. And I don't know if we have time for questions. If we do, I'm um, happy to answer them. Thank you. Do you have any? because the, the maintainer of EscoGen is here. <laughs> so we actually started building Esco Approach um, with the idea of uh, extracting all the complexity. And uh, when I was building that tool, the library, which I actually started like two years ago, I, I met Jonas. Uh, he wanted to build EscoGen, and he, we were talking about that. He, he took a different approach there, which is like um, he wanted to provide a, a, a like more super flexible uh, way of defining your project. So you have the YAML and you can almost define any, anything from your projects like build phases, uh, targets, schemes, almost any setting that you will configure in the project. My idea was more like doing something more like um, abstracted, you know, like uh, I don't want you to think in terms of build phases. I want you to tell me or describe me how you would, uh, how you want your project to be. And all the details, we take care of that, those details for you. It's like a Swift UI and UI kit. Swift UI is like the creative, kind of like simplified version, and EscoGen is like a more, uh, so we are collaborating actually, like uh, we both use Esco Pro, so we, whenever there is something new, we work on like building that feature. I think it depends on your need. If you need something more flexible and you would like to have control of everything, EscoGen is an amazing tool. Twist is not only generation, right now we only offer that, but I, I would like to build more features on top of it. I would like to provide a command line tool based on that, so it's kind of. And if you want to talk to, to Jonas, he's here. Like if you need something, it's got Jen Any other 